Hey there, it's Rashida Geddes, your coach and mentor, and welcome to Business Talks, the place to find tips and insight on creating a business career and life in Montreal on your own terms. According to the BML Wealth Institute, almost half of Canadians feel nervous or insecure when they think about the word debt. But there's no denying that in the world that we live in today, money and debt are high on the things that we think about. While close to 40% of households are carrying some form of personal debt, Statistics Canada reports that 14% of families have consumers' debts that exceed their annual after-tax income. Rising prices, excess consumption, stagnant salaries for most have not helped. The concept of using credit cards and lines of credit to pay for what we can't afford is all too common, even necessary for some, and can lead to some serious financial implications. So what's the answer? Is it possible to live debt-free in 2016? My guest Lama Ferran thinks it is. Take a look. Lama Ferran is the founder and certified money coach for MaxWorth.ca. She is also a monthly guest speaker on the CJD Tommy Schumacher Show and a blogger for the Huffington Post. Her money journey started at the age of seven when she decided to start her own business selling used magazines. Lama has maintained a proactive approach to managing her money using custom spreadsheets to help keep track of spending for more than 15 years and now lives a debt-free life. With Lama's money-saving strategies, she and her husband have been able to pay off their mortgage in half the time it takes most Canadians to pay their 25-year loan. Lama knows money. Her financial knowledge and professional experience in loans, investments, and savings make her the go-to expert for all things financial. She's a big believer in living with the peace of mind that comes from being debt-free and has been teaching her clients to do the same. Her mission is to bring personal and financial peace to families striving for financial independence. So I want to thank you, Lama, for joining us today and really being uh, able to inspire our audience. Thank My you. first question is, and I know that some people might be asking at home, what is a money coach? And what is the difference between a money coach and a financial advisor? So can you let the audience know what the difference is? Yeah, I get that question a lot because uh, people are used to having a financial planner, yes. but the word money coach is a bit or it's a little bit more of a newer concept. So what I like to tell people is that I really focus more on the budgeting and on the day-to-day, -day, whereas a financial planner is more focused on retirement, on investments, on where you see yourself going. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to help people with where, how are they gonna pay their debts tomorrow or how are they gonna pay their bills next month. So it's really more of a shorter term um, approach. And also the other thing that I focus on is the behavioral aspect of money. Yes. So, you know, a lot of emotions are attached with money so I dig into their background their history their past their childhood to know how did they come to be with money the way they are today of course of which course. is not something that financial planners covers usually exactly <laughs> now I know that two years ago you and your family became debt-free mortgage free yeah which is uh, a big feat on its own yeah. Can you tell our audience some of the steps that you took, some of the things that you did to bring your debt down to zero? Yeah. Well, first of all, when we say debt free, it's really just the mortgage because I never had any other kind of debts. Um, I've been using credit cards for 20 years. I never paid one cent of interest on my credit card or on the line of credits. Mm -hmm. But when it came to the mortgage, really the number one tip that I can give people is that I never refinanced, meaning that I never, you know, the mortgage was decreasing throughout the years. I never went back to the bank and refinanced to increase the balance. Um, so that's number one. And the other thing is anytime me or my husband would get a bonus, for example, at work, it would go straight to the mortgage. So it was always, we took advantage of the prepayment options, you know, mm -hmm. the lump sums, the double up payments. Um, and we're patient, we're patient. You know, we built, it was a brand new house, so yes. it came with an unfinished basement. Of course. It took us seven years to finish the basement. Wow. We did not go right away, put it on the line of credit and finished it. Um, another example for, um, for example, the deck. It came with a tiny deck, you know, that the contractor put. And again, it took us 12 years to decide to take out the original deck and put a brand new deck. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, we paid it cash, it was done. Yes. Whereas what I see uh, most people doing is doing the basement, doing the deck, and putting it on the home line of credit. Of course. Which they think is their money, but at the end of the day, it's not your money. Of course. So. And I think that 
getting to this point or getting to that point really is a learned consciousness, yeah. a learned consciousness about how we spend our money and about what we spend our money on mm -hmm. and making the concessions necessary to be able to uh, pay your debt off in half its time. Yeah. Now, you talk often about the debt trap of entitlement. Can you explain to our audience what that is and how that affects the way that we spend our money? Well, people have this mentality of, I deserve it. I yes. work hard, I deserve it. And not only I deserve it, I deserve it right now. Of course, I'm this in, minute. This minute, <laughs> you know, I see the couch, I like it, yes. I, I work hard, I deserve to buy it today. So what I really tell people is, we live in a society where everywhere you go, it's buy now, pay later. Yes. So how about if we switch that around and we say, save now, buy later. Mm. So you see a couch, you like it, it's, let's assume it's $1,200. Mm -hmm. um, and so you put aside $100 every month, and in a year you can go buy it cash instead of taking the financing option of the retailer. So if you go with the, um, you know, if you put aside this I deserve it attitude, that will help a lot. Because really what I feel people deserve is not the stuff, but they deserve more the peace of mind that you go to bed and your finances are under control, your family's okay, your future is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what people really deserve. They don't deserve this stuff. <laughs> so you're talking about the delayed gratification. Exactly. About saying to yourself, you know what, maybe I can't buy it today, Yeah. but imagine what I'm able to do for my family mm -hmm. with this being the situation, right? Yeah. So you often talk about mindful spending, and I think that's also important, that, yeah. that those questions that you're asking yourself, they need to be asked in those moments when you're about to spend your money to buy something. How can we master that? Well, really, mindfulness at the end of the day is being in the present moment. So mindful spending is about you being mentally in the present moment when you're pulling out that credit card from your wallet and not doing it on autopilot because you're so used to it. And it's also about asking yourself questions in that moment is, do I really need it, mm -hmm. right? Do, or is it because my neighbor got it or because my friend got it or because I saw an ad about it? So it's really understanding the, the reasons behind why you're buying something. And is it because maybe you had a stressful day at work and you feel you deserve to go on a shopping retail yes. therapy uh, session or you know it could be many reasons but it's really understanding the reasons why you're buying something so this is what I, I call mindful spending it's mm -hmm. being in the present moment and understanding it and if it's to fulfill another need than what this thing is supposed to do then you know that it's not necessary. Okay, so yeah. about taking a moment maybe before you're about to swipe that card yeah. and purchase those pair of shoes to say, do I really need this? Yeah, I have a very good trick for my clients. I give them a little pouch to insert the credit card in it. So when they're actually pulling out the credit card, mm. it has a whole series of questions for them to ask themselves in that moment. And it's right in your face so you can't miss it. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Now. We know that being debt free in a society where you have mortgages and leases and mm -hmm. cars and things of that nature seems quite, you know, impossible in some cases. Is there such a thing as good debt and bad debt? And is there a, a normal amount of debt that someone could be carrying? You know, what is yeah. normal for people? What should be normal? Well, unfortunately, the norm is, is becoming that more and more people have more and more debts. So the norm is becoming uh, to have debts. But what's advisable yes. is to really aim for the good debt. And the difference really is um, the good debt, you have to think about it, is do you have something to show for that debt? For example, a house, OK, you bought an assets that's appreciating over time. So I look at it as a good debt. Um, a car loan is not necessarily a good debt mm -hmm. because the car depreciates. And then at the end of the day, you're going to be left with a loan and a car that's worth not much. Mm -hmm. um, credit cards, line of credits, all these things are, I look at them as bad debt. Mm -hmm. um, so good debts is really something, it's a debt that you take on to buy an asset that appreciates over time. Mm -hmm. So you have something to show for it. Uh, the other one is bad debt is really equivalent to consumption debt. You consumed it and it disappeared. You That's can't it. show anything for it exactly. besides, you know, maybe memories or Or the stuff euphoric on you. feeling that you felt when you initially put that on for the first time, exactly. right? Exactly. But then, you know, I have to, to um, talk about the home line of credit because it is a debt that's associated with the home, which is an asset that appreciates, but it's not necessarily a good debt either. Mm -hmm. Because if you're using your home line of credit to uh, do renovations that are not going to increase the, your home value, then that's not 
necessarily good debt. If you're using home, your home line of credit to consolidate other debt, that's also not a very good way of using your debt. But if you use, for example, if you use it to um, as a down payment to buy an investment property, then by all means, you know. Okay. And I know you were mentioning before about not refinancing. That was mm -hmm. one of the things that you did when you were looking at paying off your mortgage in half the time. Yeah. What do you say, what do you think is the most important action that you took to be able to pay that mortgage off in half the time? I was determined mm -hmm. to do it and uh, I was very conscious of where we were spending our money and how we were spending our money. So it's really having your goal and saying, okay, I'm going to let go of these other things that for me were less important and then put my money more towards the uh, mortgage. For example, when I got my annual bonus, I could have said, hey, I deserve it. I worked hard the whole of year. Course. I'm going to go, I don't know, on a shopping trip or something. Or take a nice vacation. Or take a nice vacation. But I said, no, I'm going to put it towards the mortgage because that's money that I wasn't really counting on. So it doesn't exist. It's just going to go to the mortgage. So it's about really being focused and saying, you know what, what's my top priority? Yeah. And your top priority was paying off that mortgage. That was the only debt that you were carrying as That's a family. Right. And you were saying anything that, any extra resources that I have are going straight to that. Exactly. So there was no non, there was non-negotiable. It was non-negotiable as to where that money was going. Yeah. Everyone knew it was kind of, you know, your husband knew, you yeah. knew that <laughs> any money that came in that was extra from your everyday expenses was going to pay that mortgage. And That's I think right. that was, that's a, a conscious a conscious thing that we have to do is about saying, you know, what is the top priority? And then mm -hmm. making sure that everything that we do is aligned to that top priority. Exactly. Now, one thing you were mentioning before is also about people and how people have their own different backgrounds about how they learned about money and what mm -hmm. the things that they, the things that they learned growing up. What were you taught as a child growing up about money? Well, I live, you know, in my childhood, my parents did not have credit cards, of course. We did not have mm -hmm. debts. We didn't have any of that. So this is what I grew up with. You don't, you don't have the money right now, you just don't buy it. And the other thing is, I grew up, we were four siblings. So let's say my mom had to buy something for my brother or my sister. She made it very clear that she's not going to buy something for all four of us because one of us needs something. Yes. So that really taught me to differentiate between my needs and my wants. So if she bought me something that day and my brothers or sisters complained that, you know, why did my sister get this and I didn't get that? And the answer was always very clear. She needs it. You don't. Mm -hmm. The day you need something, you'll get it. So I think it's very important to really go back to basics and teach people and their, their, the kids about needs and wants, because this is where we get completely lost right now, because everything is a need, exactly. right? The latest smartphone is a need, the latest uh, car is a need, everything is a need, but whereas the, exactly. really their wants. Of course, and the difficulty I think parents see is that, well, if all the other kids are having them, why can't my kid have them? And, and why can't I afford, why can I buy it for my kid if I can afford it, right? If the, and affording is, of course, subjective. Yeah. Because some people afford it with a line of credit or some people afford it with a credit card and not with actual funds. So exactly. I think it's really, uh, really important what you were saying about how your parents taught you the difference between a need and a want. And that really uh, goes into my next question about what, what age should we be teaching our kids about money? And what words or associations should we be doing with money so mm -hmm. that kids have a positive outlook? Because yeah. when some people think about money, they think of it as something daunting, you know, and they might have a scarcity mentality or an abundance mentality. And it's kind of like the two extremes. So what can we do as parents to kind of make sure that we're teaching our kids the right things about money? Yeah, well, as you can imagine, as a money coach, I talk a lot about money <laughs> with my kids and with my husband and everything. Yes. Uh, my kids are five and seven. And um, I'll tell you that my seven-year-old, he knows the concept of the mortgage. He knows the concept of the credit card wow. because he sees me using the card. So I wanted to really... I wanted him to understand that this is not something that you just swipe and life is good. Yes. I told him that if we don't, you know, they add them up at the end of the month and when I get the bill, I have to pay it in full. And if I don't, I have to pay 20% more. And I explained it to him, you know, if I bought something for $100 and I don't pay it, well, guess how much I have to pay? $120. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, of course he said no. So he's understanding that this is not just a thing that you swipe. and. Um, so depending on the kid as well, I mean, you can start at five years old and the important thing is to give them their own money so yes. that they can make decisions. So they, they feel responsible for what this thing does. So you can take them to the store, they see a toy that costs $40 and they think, oh, wait a minute, I need like to save for six months to get this toy. Yes. So they have an idea of 
how much they need to save and you can also teach them to set goals whether that you know getting that toy or having an experience or going to the movies so setting small goals for their age obviously mm -hmm. but it's important to give them the money so that they learn how to make decisions spending decisions saving decisions giving yeah. charity right and I think it's a it's a good way for them to be able to understand how they can manage their own money. It's yeah. kind of giving them that independence to say, you know what, this is my money and I can potentially use it in whatever way I want. Yeah. So they're going to create positive and good habits as a result of the things that you're teaching them. Yeah. Now, these are kids, so they're, they're malleable and they're, they're impressionable <laughs> and they're, they're ready and eager to learn. But let's talk about adults. You know, we're talking about money and money and relationships are one of the, you know, the biggest... Uh, the biggest topics of yeah. conversation. It could be the topics of arguments. It could be the topics of um, uh, disagreements between couples. What, what, should, what should couples be telling themselves about money and how should they go about talking about um, their finances? Yeah. Well, one of the first things that I do when I work with couples is to dig back into their childhood. I really want the couple to understand where the other person comes from, what they lived um, with money, how, how they lived uh, money in, throughout their life, what kind of experiences they had. Sometimes they might be traumatic experiences that they never discussed, they never talked about. So when I do, I do this exercise called money biography where let's say, you know, you tell your whole life story mm -hmm. to your, to your uh, partner uh, from a money perspective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell my partner my life story with money. And we literally discover each other from a money perspective because I'm sure even if people have been married for 20 years, they never discuss money to this depth. Yes. So understanding really where the other person comes from is the first step to starting to better communicate around money. And then there's also uh, communication frameworks that I um, that I uh, give them is how to talk about money in a very neutral way, yes. in a way that you feel that you know you understand why this created an of issue, course. why it's not getting your partner f certain need fulfilled. Um, and it's understanding their, you know, their vulnerabilities, their weaknesses, what triggers them and why it triggers them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's important in what you're doing is because if you understand what your, you, what your husband or wife's trigger is, mm -hmm. then you're better able and better proactively prepared to be able to help them whenever they get into that situation when yeah. you know you can kind of act as their accountability coach and say, mm -hmm. hey, remember, we had this discussion and you told me that this was a point, you know, whenever you get to this point in your career or you get to this point of your day, you know, you start thinking about spending or start yeah. thinking about shopping and that's an emotional buy exactly. and not you know a, a, a strategic buy so I think that that's really yeah. important that that couples need to get to the root mm -hmm. of what their their money challenges are yeah. and work together to kind of as a team to create that money foundation that I think families need and that that foundation that solid foundation is what we're going to teach our kids exactly. and those kids are then going to be able to understand what's important and what's not important and you know that instant gratification they'll be oh, able yeah. to understand <laughs> now they'll have the 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 recourse and they'll have the strength to be able to say no to their friends or no to you know people around them that that want to get them to buy into something or buy into a, a product yeah. so i think that's really really good advice getting to the root of, of what our money challenges are and really creating a strategic plan to be able to put something you know, in place. Yep. Now, Lama, tell people how they can get in contact with you, how they can find out more about the things that you're doing and, and where they can go to figure that out. Well, yeah, the first place would be my website, of course. So it's uh, maxworth.ca. And what I encourage people to do is to download my free ebook. Yes. So it's a guide where uh, it's called The Seven Techniques to... Uh, uh, for your financial well-being, so you it's really a good that. start. <laughs> Seven techniques. <laughs> so it's a good place to start, yes. and uh, from there you can get in touch with me. And I usually offer a half an hour um, free consultation for any new client, so we can see if we're a good match. We can work together, and we take it from there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lama. Thank you. And have yourself a good day. Thank you very much. The two takeaways that I'm taking from my interview with Lama today is one, you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional about your finances, about your budget, and the life you want to live. The second takeaway is that living a debt-free life is possible with a structure and plan in place to keep you on track. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I also want to thank my guest Lama today for giving her money advice. 
Are you looking to create a career, business, and life on your own terms? Are you looking to leverage your strengths so that you can transform your life? Visit RashidaGettys.com to figure out how I can help you and your business. Empower, mentor, lead, and never stop learning. Bye for now.